it's now time to introduce our special guest. We're thrilled to have with us tonight, Brooke Goldner, MD. Dr. Brooke Goldner has written two best-selling books, Goodbye Lupus and Green Smoothie Recipes to Kickstart Your Health and Healing. She has been featured in multiple documentaries, such as Eating You Alive, Whitewashed, and The Conspiracy Against Your Health. She is a regular contributor to the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies, and she was featured in the Journal of Disease Reversal, Reversing Lupus in Herself, as well as multiple case studies in reversing end-stage kidney failure with her hypernourishing nutrition protocol. She is a graduate of the Temple University School of Medicine, was chief resident at UCLA Harbor Residency, and holds a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. Dr. Golder's presentation tonight is entitled Reversing Lupus, Sjogren's, and Many Other Chronic Diseases with Supermarket Foods. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brooke Goldner. As Lorraine mentioned, I am a board-certified medical doctor, and uh, my original training actually is in psychiatry and neurology. And uh, in my previous life, I was a medical director at a nonprofit. I treated the homeless, which was actually my dream job, I thought. That was what I, I wanted to do, was help homeless people. And I did that for years in Long Beach, California. Um, but my life kind of got changed. Anybody ever have something happen where your life just kind of took a different turn than you expected? Anybody relate to that? Yes. So um, before I was ever a doctor, I was actually a patient. And when I was 16 years old, I was diagnosed with a disease called lupus. How many of you guys know what lupus is or have heard of it? Okay, so some of you have, some of you ha haven't. So lupus is an autoimmune disease. So what that means is it's a disease where your body's immune system suddenly stops recognizing self from non-self, right? So normally your immune system is there to protect you. It's there to, uh, you know, if you get a bacterial infection or a viral infection, it's supposed to go out and kill that virus or kill that bacteria, right? Keep you safe and healthy. But when people get sick with autoimmune disease, they generate so much inflammation in their body that their immune system gets confused. And instead of protecting them, their immune system starts going out and finding new things to attack that actually belong to them. So uh, symptoms of autoimmune disease really vary, and the way they diagnose them depends on which antibodies you get and which parts of your body get attacked. But really, it's all the same thing in my mind. And for me, I had lupus, which can affect a lot of different organs in your body. And for me, they attacked my kidneys. So when I was diagnosed at 16, I went to the doctor because I had arthritis everywhere. I had it in my knees. It would move around. It would go from shoulder to shoulder. Uh, it would end up in my fingers where it was hard to hold my pencil in class. And that was bothersome, but I didn't know what it was. I wasn't too worried about it yet. And then I developed a rash across my face one day when I was out in the sun. Uh, people with lupus often have photosensitivity where being in the sun makes us worse. My dad has something called dad science. Any of you guys have dads that kind of make stuff up and they, they think that it's science? Yes. Okay. So, so my dad has this dad science and he looked at me and he saw this rash across my face and he said, you know, I think that the skin is the window to your body. And if there's something wrong with your skin, then there's probably something wrong inside. Now I actually teach this now. So this science, he was actually on track on this one, but I ended up at the hospital and my primary care doctor met us there and she quickly identified that this was lupus. Now my blood tests then showed that my kidneys were failing. And that was actually a lot scarier. Um, so by the time I was diagnosed, they, uh, they immediately sent me in the next day for a kidney biopsy. So I was in stage four kidney failure already. So what they told me was that I was six months away from com complete kidney failure and I was either going to be on dialysis or wouldn't make it at all. So this was all very sudden. You know, I, I thought I was healthy, and next thing you know, uh, they're planning for dialysis. And uh, it was, even as difficult as it was for me to process, it was much more devastating for my family. Um, I, I understand now that, you know, when one person is sick, it's like the whole family feels it, right? It's not just one person who goes through it. And a lot of times I felt like I could handle it better than my family could. Um, my family is uh, all immigrants. They were Holocaust survivors. My mother came in on a boat through Ellis Island back when they did it that way. And so uh, I was born to live the American dream. That's what my family wanted. And so I'm an only child. My parents couldn't afford to have more kids. And so I was going to have everything that nobody else wanted or could have. They wanted, but they couldn't have. And um, 
here I was at 16 years old and devastatingly ill. And my grandfather had just died a couple of years before of cancer, and it was really too much. It was too much for everybody, you know. Um, my mom was really strong. She, uh, she used to always tell me, you know, she kept me focused, that this is something you have to deal with, but this isn't who you are, and you're going to finish high school, and you're going to go to college, and you're going to do all these things, so you better figure out how to study. <laughs> you know, because at the time, the only thing that they could figure out to treat me with was, you know, this was back in the ni early 90s, uh, so they didn't have all the fancy medicines they have now. It was mostly steroids. And they knew with my level of lupus and the kidney failure, ster steroids wasn't going to be enough. So um, they were going to try something experimental at the time, which was to use chemotherapy to shut off my immune system. Now, what, what, medicine, what disease do you normally think of when you hear chemotherapy? Cancer, right. And so cancer is a poison that's supposed to um, kill off cells that are reproducing too quickly, which is what cancer is. But the side effect of chemotherapy is that it shuts off people's immune systems, which is why people with cancer often die of infections. So they thought, well, if your immune system is killing you, maybe if we shut it off on purpose, we can stop this illness. Like control, alt, delete for folks who used to have old computers, right? Like we just, whenever something's wrong with your phone or your computer, what do you do? You just shut it off, right? And then hopefully when it comes back on, it's like magic, everything's okay. So they thought maybe that will work for the human body because you didn't have lupus before. Maybe if we do this with the medicines and it doesn't kill you, maybe you'll, you know, your, your immune system will, will work again. And uh, so that was the plan. Now, they still use chemotherapy for uh, lupus nephritis, which is what it's called. And with mixed results, you know, Selena Gomez, she has lupus and she did the chemotherapy and it didn't work and she ended up with a transplant anyway. So um, they got me on the chemotherapy and, but they didn't know how much to use because it was still experimental at the time. So they said, well, you know, nowadays people use it for a few weeks, maybe a couple months. But for me, they used it for two years straight. So I was one of the lucky early people to try it because what happened was the chemotherapy would start and my lupus would get better because my immune system would shut off and then they would stop the chemo and then my immune system would get right back to where it was and my kidneys would start failing again. So it took two years straight before that, um, before it actually worked. And uh, that was 16 through 18 while everyone else is worrying about prom and boyfriends and stuff. I'm trying to plan how to study for my AP biology test because I got chemo Friday. So the weekend's gonna be shot. So I gotta get my studying done early. And that's really what I did. What, you know, I was already a nerd before I got sick. But at this point, it was the only thing that kept me going was, well, you know, if I just study and read my books, maybe one day I can do something important with my life for however much time I have. And so I thought, well, maybe I can just really study hard and maybe I could be a doctor one day. And however long I'm alive, I can take care of people and help people and my life will have mattered in some way. So that was the plan. And, uh, and my mom really was so key to helping me do that. You know, she, uh, she was always there to say, hey, it could always be worse, although sometimes that got me annoyed. <laughs> but uh, she'd say, it could always be worse. You have so much going for you. You're going to get through this, you know, and she just never let me focus on my illness. But I could still hear her crying in her room at night. And, uh, and my grandmother, oh, my grandmother, I actually just lost her at 99. She, she lived a long life. But my grandmother, I still, it's burned into my memory seeing her on the kitchen floor on her knees, just screaming and praying to God to take her and spare my life. So I'm going to give away the ending and let you know I made it. <laughs> but, oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad you guys are happy about that. I appreciate that. All right. Um, but, you know, it was really tough. It was tough on all of us. But I made it through. And I just, I, I always give this advice to folks who are struggling, whether it's with illness or with something else, financial stressors or relationship issues, to remember that your stressors and the things that you're struggling with, that they, those, don't let those things define you. Don't let those things define your life. You were born with a gift. I think all of us are born with a gift we're meant to give. And you have to focus on your purpose and your passion and the relationships that matter to you and not on the struggle. Because if the struggle becomes your life, it's already over. And that's what worked for me. And, and the cool thing was after two years, I did finally go into remission. So uh, how many of you guys know what remission is? Is it a cure? No, so remission means your disease is currently not killing you. And I was all for it. I was there for that. That's good. <laughs> so when I was in remission, I still had lupus. Every blood test I took showed I had lupus, uh, but it was stable. 
and my kidneys were stable and that was worthy. I mean, I still, every time I had tests done, I still had protein in my urine, which showed that I had some kidney damage, but I was considered stable at the time. I was able to stop chemotherapy finally. And a week after my last chemotherapy was my first day of college. I actually, uh, in spite of the, all of the things I'd been through and all the medications I took, I was able to graduate in the top 10 of my class. I got a scholarship to Carnegie Mellon and uh, I was really, really excited to be a normal kid just going to school instead of going to school and doing chemo. That was really nice. And so that's what I did. And I actually managed to stay in remission in college because um, I listened to my doctors, which it's rare. I, I was taught, my, doc, my, my family taught me to always do whatever your doctor says. I have yet to meet patients that were taught the same thing that I was taught. <laughs> but, um, you know, they told me, you know, take your medicine, avoid stress, avoid sunlight, and get enough sleep. I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so sunlight wasn't an issue. I don't know if you guys have ever been there. Uh, there's no sunlight there. And, um, and I, I did. I made sure I got enough sleep. If I didn't get enough sleep, I'd wake up with my arthritis pain. I'd take my pills for that. I'd be okay. But I managed to stay stable through all of college, which was really exciting. I really wanted to stay healthy. Uh, and then I, it was the first time I didn't listen to my doctors because they told me, always make sure you get enough sleep and always avoid stress. And so I decided to go to medical school. So that is not the best way to follow that advice. And actually, I did get sick again in medical school. Um, I was just determined, though. I just felt in my heart that that's what I wanted to do. And so I went to medical school. And at the time, we didn't have all the laws that protect med students now with hours. So now you're not allowed to work med students longer than 80 hours a week. Uh, but that wasn't in place when I was a student. So at one point, I realized I was working about 100 hours a week. And I was just so exhausted all the time. And uh, I started getting weird symptoms. It wasn't the symptoms I had before. They were new ones. Uh, but I had these little red dots in all my fingernails. And I started getting double vision, like the entire world splitting in half double vision, where I could see it side by side. And whenever it happened, I just have to hold on to the wall and wait for the world to come back together again. And maybe it would take 30 seconds or so, maybe a little longer. I'd just stand there, kind of dizzy. And then it would come back together. And I'd go on with my day, a uh, little bit disturbed by that. So I, I went and told one of my attendings at the time, so when you're a medical student, you have doctors that are in charge of you, and they're called attendings. So I went to my attending, and I said, listen, um, I think something's really wrong with me, because I have these dots in my nails, I'm getting double vision, I have lupus, something's wrong. And she said, ah, you know, you're probably fine. Med students always think they have everything. And uh, now this is true. I mean, um, I, had a, I had a roommate in medical school and she was convinced for months that she had an inflamed prostate. And I was like, no, no, I don't think that's it. So, but it is true. I mean, med students are notorious for whatever chapter they're on. They think they have that. I was the opposite. Every chapter I was in, I'm like, nope, I don't want that either. No, that, you know, you can keep that, you know, because at the end of every chapter, it said people more likely to have this disease are, and then lupus was always there. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not doing that one either. Uh, so so I didn't want that, but I knew something was wrong, and they weren't listening. I went, well, Thanksgiving break's coming. I'll just go see my doctors then and find out what this is. And I didn't make it to Thanksgiving break. Uh, a few days later, I was in the family practice um, clinic, and I was just giving flu shots and stuff all day and doing stuff like that. And I was charting at one point, and I remember I was sitting at the chart, and uh, I suddenly just felt really disconnected. It's hard to describe. I felt like I was kind of dreaming. And I remember sitting there trying to figure out if I was awake or dreaming. I couldn't figure it out. And I was trying to figure out, did I give all those shots today? Or did I dream that I gave the shots? Maybe I'm home right now. And I remember looking at the resident and he looked at me and I couldn't talk. Like I wanted to say something and ask him and I couldn't say anything. And I heard this kind of buzzing in my ears and I don't know what happened after that because the next memory I have, I was waking up and I was on the chart. I was sleeping on the chart and, uh, and the, the whole room was empty. The clinic was empty. And so obviously the uh, doctor saw a med student passed out on a chart and didn't think anything of it because we worked 100 hour weeks. So they probably just thought I was sleeping. But um, I remember I woke up and I was still confused. But I, I, all I could think about was I just want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. So I went and picked up my keys and I got in my car. Uh, and I, I had this Jeep because it's Pittsburgh. So you have to be able to drive with all the snow. And I start the car and I don't know how to get home. I'm trying to think about it and I don't know how to get home. So I remember driving really slowly, like five miles an hour, stopping at every intersection 
to see if anything looked familiar. And I actually worked only a couple miles from the clinic. So I kind of think my cerebellum took me home. You know how sometimes you could, you end up somewhere and you don't know how you got there? Because you were busy talking or doing something, and you're like, oh, I'm here. So there's an unconscious part of you that remembers things, and I think that's how I got home. And I parked up on the curb, and I went and passed out in my apartment. And uh, I felt better after about 10, 12 hours of sleep, but I obviously wasn't okay. And so I went to my doctor's, and I found out that the lupus was active again. But now I had a new antibody. Instead of attacking my kidneys, it was creating blood clots. So I was actually sending blood clots into my brain, and that's why I was getting double vision, and that's what I, and I had something called a mini stroke or a transient ischemic attack where you have a clot that goes through your brain, but then it dissolves again. It doesn't stay and turn into a major stroke. Um, so they're considered temporary, and they told me that there was no permanent damage. I still think that I was smarter before and funnier now, but <laughs> they, <laughs> they insist there wasn't permanent damage done. But, you know, this, so this was terrifying because... For me, you know, I had already made peace with the fact that I wasn't going to live a very long life. Um, I just met somebody yesterday at the beach. I was watching the sunset, and a guy told me his cousin just died of lupus in her 50s. So I knew I wasn't going to live a long life, especially now that I was a med student. And uh, I knew that I could never have children um, because that would kill me, either with a kidney failure or now with blood clots. I mean, being pregnant is a stroke risk in itself. So they told me I could never have children. So all these things are going through my mind. But for me, even with knowing those things, not having kids, not living long. My brain was the one thing I always counted on. So I figured even if I was in a wheelchair, I could still practice medicine. I could still function because my brain was what I had. I was funny, I was smart, I could keep those things. But if I have a stroke, I could lose everything I ever thought I had. So I was really upset and I cried for about two weeks straight, uh, just really mourning it. And I think it's important to mourn when things go wrong. You don't want to just suppress it and put it away. And I mourned it. Um, and then I finally got back to that place where I always live in my heart, which is a place of gratitude that, you know what, I can't choose the things that happened to me. But one, I'm still not dead. So lupus didn't get me yet. <laughs> right? Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was, I was not dead. Not dead is good. Right? Two, there was a medicine that could help me. So they told me I'd have to inject myself in the belly every day for the rest of my life to make sure that my blood stayed thin and I wouldn't have clots. But don't fall down and hit your head because you'll bleed into your brain. Um, but at least I had that medicine. And, you know, I could keep going. I could keep going. And, and I thought, you know, I just got my first choice of residency out in California. I was going to be going, I was leaving to go towards the sunshine. I decided I was done with winter and I wanted to, you guys can relate, right? So I wanted to go somewhere where I could see sunlight again. And, uh, and how many people get to live their dream? My dream was to become a doctor and I was only months away from it and I was going to achieve my dream. And so I just felt so lucky again. And I learned that from my grandmother. My grandmother is a Holocaust survivor and her whole life she would always tell me I'm a lucky girl. She was a lucky, and she meant it because she had family, you know, and she had love in her life, and she never stayed in the past. She always stayed in the present with what she had. And so I just felt like a lucky girl again, and, uh, and I decided to, uh, to embrace that, and I just took my shots, and I kept going. And my grandmother was so scared that she wouldn't get to see me grow old, but she actually got to see me graduate medical school. So, so this is my grandma. She always looked really good for her age. Um, you can see I still had lupus. I had the big, the big cheeks from the steroids. Steroids give you these big, fat chipmunk cheeks. Um, there's my mom and my other grandmother. And yes, my dad's six foot seven. As everyone asked me that. <laughs> so it was really exciting. I was living my life and I was so happy. And then something happened that felt like the luckiest thing still to this day that's ever happened to me. Um, I fell madly in love. Anybody ever man been in love before? <laughs> So this is Thomas Tadlock, and uh, gosh, we've been together 15 years now. Um, but he is the most amazing human I've ever met. And we fell in love really, really fast. I mean, it was about a month later where he was talking to me about getting married. Now, I would love to marry this man, but I hadn't really talked to him about the lupus yet. And it wasn't because I was hiding it. It was just, you don't meet a gorgeous man and start with the lupus story. You know, like, <laughs> we talked about music and dancing and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't know that this was going somewhere where I had to bring that stuff up. I never like to focus on my illness. I like to focus on everything else. So at this point, I had to tell him, though, because he's talking about committing his life to me. So I had to tell him, listen, um, I have this disease. I'm sick right now with it. I take a lot of medicine. Um, and I'm not going to live a long life. In fact, as I get older, I'm going to become disabled, and you're going to have to take care of me. 
I could never have your children. And I understand if you want to back out and maybe at 28 years old, choose somebody else that you can have a long life with. And uh, he just looked at me, tears in his eyes, and he said, I just, I'd rather have a short life with you than a lifetime with anybody else. So I said, oh my God, let's get married. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we decided to get married in Maui because why not get married in Hawaii in somewhere beautiful? And um, we we're really excited about it. And we just wanted to invite our best friends and our parents and my grandmothers and his sister. That's it. Just the people who would cry, he said. And, um, and so now I had to think about a wedding dress, right? Now, I was currently an intern at the hospital, and I was on the perfect diet to be overweight and sick. It's called hospital food. Have you ever had that? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was able to exercise less than I used to. I'm eating horrible hospital food. I'm gaining weight. And, you know, it's no big deal because the white coat goes all the way down and it hides everything, you know? So that was fine. But going to Maui, there was going to be photographs. I was going to be in my bathing suit. I was going to be in my wedding dress. I wanted to look good. And so I asked my husband if he would train me. Now, my husband is uh, a celebrity trainer. At the time, he was training people on MT. TV to give them a six pack in four weeks because they've been partying too hard and they had a beer belly and they would call, they would take him from Pittsburgh and, and fly him into Manhattan to go in and help train people for MTV. So I'm like, well, I'm moving to, I'm in LA now. And, but I didn't look like, I, I didn't look like an LA girl yet. So I was like, can you help me out? And, uh, and he said, okay, so this is what we did. So he went to Carnegie Mellon as well for, uh, for science, computer science, and then switched into getting his uh, master's degree in um, physical health and training. And he was really mad when he was getting his master's degree and they kept telling him different diets work for different people. And he's like, no, that doesn't make sense. Because in computer science, when you put a program in, every time you enter a program, you get the same answer. And he's like, and cells are just like computers. They all, every human has the same kind of cells. So every program should run the same way. And so he applied his computer science education to the human body and he figured out a way to create a fast metabolism in everybody. So uh, if you have a fast metabolism, you can lose fat faster, you can gain muscle faster. So uh, I asked him to apply that to me. Now the difference was, the only difference he made in my diet was that um, at the time he was telling people to do uh, really high amounts of raw vegetables, no problem, really high amounts of omega-3s, no problem, high water intake, I can do that, and then free range meat for protein. I'd been a vegetarian since I was 12 because I loved animals. I was a cheese and egg and processed fooditarian since I was 12. So he said, okay, fine, you gotta get rid of all the saturated fat or you'll never lose all that weight. So no more of that eggs and dairy, and I guess we'll just use tofu instead of meat, but he'd never trained a vegetarian before. So here's, a, here's what I look like before. Um, that's not Thomas, but he's fine with it. He's a friend of mine that I made in LA. Um, but that's what I looked like before. I wasn't you know, super overweight, but I was about a size 11. Um, and you know, still sick. And I followed what he told me to do for three and a half months. And the cool thing was I went from a size 11 to a size three in that time. That's, that's the day before we got married at Twin Falls in Maui. You guys know that the flat spot? He looked good too. I know he was, yeah, <laughs> I didn't say he's a hot nerd. I didn't mention that. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, but the, even better than that was I felt the best I'd ever felt my whole life. I no longer had arthritis. I didn't have the migraine headaches. I didn't have any rashes. I had so much energy, I could work a whole night, a 30 hour shift at the hospital, and then go to the gym afterwards. That's not normal for people who don't have lupus. So I felt so good. And then I went to the doctor and uh, I had a new rheumatologist out in California because I'd been trained in Pennsylvania. And I went to the rheumatologist and uh, he ran some lab work for me and he said, I don't, there must have been a mistake in the labs because these labs are not positive for lupus or negative for lupus. And I saw your chart and you obviously have it. So he goes, I don't know what's wrong. You just go to your wedding, come back and we'll retest everything and get, so, okay. So I went to the wedding, I came back, retested everything and it's still negative for lupus. And now my blood count antibodies are gone too. And then by the way, my high cholesterol was now normal. I was told in my twenties, my cholesterol was high because of genetics, not because I ate so much cheese. Magically, my cholesterol is better too. And nobody could figure out what happened because the only thing I changed was my diet. And I had just graduated medical school, so I knew that diet had nothing to do with health. <laughs> so we couldn't figure out what it could be. So I just kind of went on that way and I just enjoyed feeling good and I finished my residency. And um, let me see, I'll show you. We got, so that's, that's our wedding out in Maui. And it was just a beautiful day. I mean, we both cried through the whole thing and it was really, really beautiful. So. 
I'm healthy now for four years after the wedding, and I get this crazy idea in my head. I'm really feeling good, and I thought, well, what if we get pregnant? And my husband goes, what? You told me when we met that if you, that was a death sentence, that you can't have children and you're healthy now, you're doing well. Why would we mess with that? And I said, I know, but I, I, I can feel that I'm healthy now. And he's like, yeah, that's great. But all the doctors say that you're going to get sick again sometime soon and we shouldn't mess with it. And I said, yeah, but I know I am. I know I am. My mom volunteered to carry the baby for me. Um, my best friend volunteer to carry the baby for me. Um, my husband didn't understand how it worked, and he's like, they're very attractive, but I don't think I can, I can do this. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I insisted, and he, he really, really didn't want to do it. But you can convince a man. And anyway, so I did get pregnant. And, um, and here's the thing. So I go to the OBGYN, and I'm pregnant now. And she asked me my health history. And I said, um, well, I used to have lupus. And she said, what? You don't used to have lupus. You have lupus. So she sent me to the high-risk OB. High-risk OB sent me back because she goes, this lady's healthy. She doesn't have lupus. So they were just obsessively following me. And all the doctors said, it's going to come back while you're pregnant. Um, so you should start medication again. Because I'd gone off medication. I still took it for a year after my last were negative because they told me that I had lupus even though my tests were negative. And apparently, according to Western medicine, if you ever have lupus and then no longer have it, you still have it So, because it's incurable. So <laughs> it's very confusing. Or if you go to the Lupus Foundation website, if you have lupus and then you don't have it anymore, you never had it to begin with. So it's, it's all very confusing. So my doctor said, you know, um, you're going to need to uh, go on medicines while you're pregnant. And I said, well, I don't want to go on medicine. It doesn't make sense. Because I looked at my labs, right? And so I don't know if you can read this, but 2004 was right before I changed my diet. Positive antibodies for blood clots, positive DSDNA, which is a lupus antibody. But here I am in 2008 pregnant, and it's negative for blood clot antibodies. And then 2004, it's positive ANA, which is autoimmune antibodies. But then 2008, pregnant, and it's negative. So if, if my blood tests say that I don't have it, well, I don't want to take medicines while I'm pregnant. So I decided not to. I said, I don't want to die. If I start getting sick, I'll take it. So then I get through the whole pregnancy, get to the end of the pregnancy, and my son is breech. He's butt first. So I have to go get a C-section. Um, so... He entered the world butt first, and if you met him, you'd understand why. But he, <laughs> he was born healthy. That's my, my son, Solomon. And I know he's so cute. <laughs> and the doctors were like standing around waiting for something to happen. And I just felt fine. I felt really good. I went home after a couple days, and I told my doctor, I said, wow, you are an amazing surgeon because my patients that get C-sections always tell me how bad it hurts and how long it takes them to get better, and I feel fine. And, uh, and she said, hey, listen, I'm a great surgeon. Which, by the way, you want a cocky surgeon. You don't want someone nervous cutting you open. You want, you want them to be very full of themselves. But she said, you know, I'm a great surgeon, but you have an unusual ability to heal because I've never seen someone get better that fast. Um, which for me was shocking because with lupus, I could never heal anything. I had to get, a, I had a pimple that turned into a giant abscess because I couldn't even heal a bacteria in a pimple. And here I am healing from major surgery the same day because I'm so healthy. So, um, so I went home. Didn't really think much more about it. I'm still healthy. I'm producing enough milk to make this guy really fat and donate to four other families as well. And about nine days later, no, exactly nine days later, it's my birthday. It was my 32nd birthday. And my mom was there to be with the baby. And she told me to go out and enjoy my birthday. And she said, listen, he's sleeping. Go to dinner. As soon as he wakes up, I'll call you and you'll come right back and nurse him. Because I didn't want to leave his side, you know, first baby. So I'm like, well, what am I going to wear? I haven't left. I haven't gotten out of pajamas since I gave birth. And you guys have babies like you don't even bother getting dressed, right? Just just pajamas. right? So I go and I'm like, what am I going to wear? So I go in my closet and I pick I pick up my pre-pregnancy jeans and I put them on and they fit. So this is nine days after I gave birth and I'm wearing my pregnancy pre-pregnancy jeans. I had gained 40 pounds pregnant and it was just gone. <laughs> This was finally when it clicked for my husband and I that something had changed. It took us this long. That's why I always say, don't be mad at your doctors if they don't understand that it's possible to reverse diseases because it took me this long and it was my body. But it's not normal for someone with lupus to have a healthy pregnancy and childbirth and still not have lupus. And it's definitely not normal for somebody who gave birth to be back in their pre-pregnancy clothes uh, less than two weeks after they give birth. And so my husband and I finally realized that there was something very unusual about my body, that it was responding in real time 
to whatever changes I, I asked for, whatever challenges that appeared. When I was pregnant, I was pregnant. When I gave birth, then I healed up really quick. All of those things were happening in real time. And the only thing we'd ever changed was my diet. And so we decided that we had to figure out what exactly happened. What did I stop eating that could have been making me sick? And what did I start eating that could possibly accelerate cellular repair and the anti-inflammatory immune system? And when we went into it, and we went, we, I'd never even heard of plant-based doctors or nutrition. We, we did this all on our own. We went back and studied the cellular biology of how all foods affect the cells. And we realized that we'd accidentally created the most anti-inflammatory nutrition plan ever. That was impossible. So we decided that we needed to do something with this. And so we started testing it on people to see if we could get the same results. And we could. We could get people to have an, a dramatic change in their health within three to four weeks. Uh, some people completely eliminating the disease completely. So um, we decided to dedicate ourselves to that. And by the way, uh, a few years later, I decided to do it again. Uh, that was me two days before giving birth to my second son, Alex. And I am, my husband said, I'm the happiest uh, pregnant person you've ever seen. Because I was told I could never have babies. So even when I'm throwing up, I'm smiling. <laughs> he said he's never seen someone smile while they vomit. But at least it's not chemo. I was throwing up because it's a baby. Yeah, it's pretty wild. So this is my family. And uh, there's my Alex and Solomon and, and Tom and me. And because of what I learned, I now get to live a full life. This is now 14 years later and I'm still lupus free. I had lupus for 12 years straight, serious disease that almost killed me multiple times. And it's now 14 years that I don't have any disease at all. So I realized I need to dedicate my life to this. I need to teach other people how to do this because there are millions of people all over the world that are suffering and dying from diseases that they don't have to. And there's people losing people they love that they don't need to lose because the information is there. They just don't have it. So I decided that I needed to commit myself to this. And that's what I've been doing for the past decade uh, is repeating this with other people and helping them get their life back. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you as much as I can today so that you can go home with an understanding of things. And then I'm also, because they didn't give me, I need more time with you to really go into detail of how to make things work. Since I don't have that time, is it okay if I tell you at the end how to get um, hours of free classes with me and question and answer sessions so you can learn all of it in detail for free? Is that all right? Okay, cool. So I want to make sure you guys all know how to do this because everybody should have this information, okay? So I'm gonna tell you as much as I can, but then you won't panic because you're gonna get to learn it in detail later from your own house, is that cool? All right, cool. So um, I can just give you a little bit of information though. People wonder if this is good for everything. It is, um, there is, uh, it's good for rheumatoid arthritis. This is Dana, so when you come to my classes I'm gonna tell you about, I do case studies and show you how it works. Dana's had rheumatoid arthritis for years, eight to 10 out of 10 pain, would come home from work and just crash, couldn't even play with her kids. After two weeks on my nutrition plan, she stopped using her injections in her knees, stopped all of her medicines, no longer has any arthritis pain at all. Um, this is Kathy. Kathy's the one on your left. And Kathy's doctor, her rheumatologist, she had lupus, and her rheumatologist is actually plant-based. How cool is that? So her rheumatologist told her to go on a plant-based diet, but it didn't really help her. And it's because you need to have a very specific diet to reverse severe inflammation like lupus causes. So uh, because she didn't get better, he said, before you retire, because she was going to retire from a job she loved because she couldn't get out of bed, she had to, if she did get up, she had to use both arms to push herself up because her legs didn't work properly, her hips didn't work properly, she was in pain all the time, couldn't take the stairs, could barely move. And uh, so she was really struggling to function. And he said, before you retire, just do four weeks with Dr. Goldner, because I, um, I have what I call rapid recovery programs, where I work with people every single day for four weeks or six weeks to make sure they get better. I figured out that if I, if I help someone every day and I hold their hand, I'm already, I'm a mother, you know? So I'm a Jewish mother from New York. So every single day, what did you eat? How did you sleep? You know, are you stressed? Did you meditate? What are you doing? You know, so every single day I hold their hands and what happens is they get better really quickly. So she did four weeks with me and at the, by two weeks, she changed her own tire. Uh, by the end of four weeks, she had no pain at all, was able to go up and downstairs. And uh, this was her, her longtime partner was going to take care of her when she was disabled. And because she was better, they decided to get married and they sent me this picture of them on their honeymoon hiking the Grand Canyon together. And for me, this is why I do this work. I don't believe being a doctor is just about treating symptoms. It's about helping people live their lives and give their gifts. And so I always ask people, what do you want most? And that's what we aim for as the result. And uh, she's really, really happy. She's still doing really well all these years later. She's, gosh, she saw me probably about six years ago. Um, 
This is Danielle. She had lupus and Sjogren's in her 20s. If she tried to go out into the sunlight, she lived in Florida, she'd pass out just from that walk. Neuropathies, upper arms, no energy at all. Um, and after two weeks, her neuropathies were gone. By the end of the month, her aches and pains were gone. She actually has been lupus-free now for a couple of years. She has her own Instagram where she promotes plant-based diets. And uh, she just got married as well. She wants to live my story. She wants to have kids and move on forward and inspire other people to do the same. Um, this is David. You'll learn more about him. David had lupus, scleroderma, and Sjogren's. A lot of times, autoimmune disease just travel in packs because, again, once your immune system's not working, it can make any antibody against anything in your body. And um, this was the best medications could do right here. And this poor guy, he had a single mom. He lived at uh, home. He wanted to work. Nobody would hire him because he would go to job interviews, and he said they wouldn't even look at his face. So he sat home and ate out of the 7-Eleven next door and was lonely and had no quality of life at all. And he wanted to work. He wanted to do things with his life. And uh, his, his hands, which I don't show him here, but I show him in the case studies, they were like claws. And they were broken open and infected all the way to the bones. And so the doctors told him, the only thing we can do is amputate your fingers. Because the medications weren't reaching his fingers. Um, within two months, uh, this is what he looks like now off all medication after chewing my nutrition plan. Um, and he has no symptoms at all. He's been off medicines for two years now. Um, he got a job a couple months later after he did this, and uh, he now works helping the poor out in California. And uh, he's continuing the work that I couldn't keep doing, uh, working with homeless and young adults. And uh, he, just, he just texted me that he just proposed to his girlfriend. So here's another guy. And on top of that, you know, they were going to take his fingers. He now, his fingers completely healed, and he now, uh, he creates beautiful artwork that's showcased in galleries all over LA. So when you talk about people not being able to live their gift, he almost lost everything, and now he has a full life. And his mother, Glenda, carries my book, Goodbye Lupus, in her purse with his before and after pictures. Just anyone, anyone she meets, she like takes it out and like educates them about it. Um, so it works for all different kinds of autoimmune disease. Uh, Emily, she reversed, she had uh, Sjogren so bad that her, her scalp was so itchy, she spent $5,000 in supplements trying to fix it. Two weeks later, she was supposed to do four weeks with me. After two weeks, she stopped answering the phone. And I said, what happened? I was sending her text messages with a picture of Adele, you know, saying hello. You know, <laughs> like, where are you? And she said, I didn't want to bother anymore because I'm already completely better. And I just, this was, I saw her about four years ago. I just contacted her last week because I have a new book coming out at the end of the month, Goodbye Autoimmune, and her story's in there. And uh, I asked her for an update. She's like, still completely healthy, still doing great. So, um, I heard uh, Lorraine talking about kidney failure. So I've actually had some published case studies. Um, this is Mary, who uh, she had 15% kidney function left when she, no, 14% when she met me. And she was on the transplant list and her doctor said, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Don't change your diet, it won't work. And she goes, well, if it won't hurt work, it maybe it won't hurt either. Her kidney function went up 2% every week in my rapid recovery group. By the end of the group, she had 27% kidney function, was off the transplant list. Uh, and she's still doing fine. Um, and she's she also got married, and she now has energy, and she can function, and she doesn't have to worry about getting an organ taken out of her body. So it works really well for a kidney failure. Um, and there's just, I could go on and on. Lup <laughs> Scotty had to leave law school because the lupus was in her lungs, and she couldn't breathe. And she was in the ICU, in and out of the ICU. Uh, after six weeks, she was back at law school. And she's now, she also has her own Instagram account showing all of the greens and veggies she eats. Um, Sjogren's gone in two weeks. She got saliva back for the first time in many years. And antiphospholipid antibody is that blood clot antibody. Um, scleroderma, someone asked me about scleroderma in the crowd today. Uh, this is six weeks. Scleroderma uh, is an autoimmune disease that hardens the skin. And you can tell in six weeks, she looks like she had a facelift. She was so unhappy with how she looked. And it goes on and on. And so I'm going to do all those case studies for you um, when you come to the, the free class so you can learn in detail. And I stay on longer for the question and answer period than the class because I want to make sure everyone gets their questions answered. So um, this was a doctor. Lots, I have lots of doctors as clients. It turns out doctors, nurses, and pharmaceutical reps don't like to take medicine. So they usually find me. And... Um, and then this was one too, Mariana, she had lupus in her brain. So she was having four or five seizures a day when she came to me right from the ICU at the end of six weeks was not having daily seizures anymore. She's now traveling with a backpack with her boyfriend enjoying her life. And uh, it's Becky, Sjogren's so bad she couldn't even, look, in, in her house, she couldn't even have any light come in with sunglasses and foil. After six weeks, she could have the lights on again. <laughs> this is, 
Uh, Joyce, who her husband didn't want her to join the group. Her doctor said, you're going to be in a wheelchair. You're never going to get your strength back. Six weeks later, she was dancing with her cane in her hands. And she's still doing well, too. Um, I also see a lot of kids nowadays, unfortunately. Like when I got diagnosed with lupus at 16, they thought that was young. Nowadays, it's getting younger and younger. My youngest client right now with lupus is two years old. When I first met Madeline, she was 11 years old. Lupus was in her lungs, her heart, and her kidneys. And when her parents called me, she'd just been in the hospital in the ICU because there was a code blue. She stopped breathing. They had to resuscitate her. Um, her heart stopped. And when she started my program, um, so I just did for kids, but she started my program. Within two weeks, her kidney function was normal. Another week later, her heart function was normal. She's now 14 years old. She's a straight-A student. She wants to be a doctor one day for some reason. And, uh, and she's healthy. She does martial arts. She plays two instruments. She's a gifted, gifted child. And she doesn't have any disease to worry about anymore. So uh, it's really important for kids. And you know, a lot of times, people are willing to change their diet for themselves, but they don't change their kids' diet. And I get really frustrated with that because they have your genes right? So you don't want to wait for them to get sick. You want to do it right for them. But if they're already sick, this works for them too. Um, and it works for so many different things. I mean, chronic pain. Uh, this woman came to me for chronic pain and not only did she lose weight, but her, her precancer of her cervix and her HPV disappeared. So I'm still surprised sometimes when things happen. It makes sense because the body is programmed to heal itself, but sometimes I still have my old medical programming in my head that says, you know, HPV is incurable. It's a virus, you know, all that stuff. And then goes away and people get healthy because their body can fight it when it has the right tools. So it goes on and on. And I mean, people get mad at me when I post this one, but she did rapid recovery with me and her celiac antibodies went away two years ago and she can eat greens now. It's her story. It's true. Um, this man came to my husband for, for fat loss and went on the plan and he'd had seizures for decades and they went away and they were gone for two years straight until he decided to start eating meat again. And they came back within two weeks. So I said, okay, it's all right, man, you did research. Sometimes you have to do research. So he did some research and he knows. But um, before I get to the protocol, I was wondering if I could just leave you with a story uh, just to bring it all in. Because I like to get people really inspired before I hit the science so that they're excited. Yeah? Okay, so so um, this is Rachel. Rachel had lupus and Sjogren's disease, and she called me up when she was four weeks away from her delivery date. She was getting a C-section, so we knew exactly four weeks. So every time she'd gotten pregnant, she had an older daughter, and she'd also had a miscarriage. And every time she got pregnant, she'd end up in the ICU because lupus usually gets worse through pregnancy and delivery. So she decided to have another kid anyway because her husband and her really wanted to do it. And she, um, she was really terrified because she had an older kid, a new baby's coming, and she was gonna end up in the hospital again. So she Googled, she found my book, Goodbye Lupus, called me right away, and I said, we have no time to spare. We're doing four weeks of rapid recovery starting today so we can get you ready for your, for your delivery. And uh, she had already gone on her, um, her disability for after having her baby or maternity leave because her back pain was super intense. She was exhausted, she wasn't functioning. So <laughs> she actually, she got better so fast she thought the back pain was from pregnancy. It wasn't. The back pain went away. Her energy was so high that the day before she went in for the C-section, she was running through a park with her older daughter, teaching her how to fly a kite. So she had a healthy delivery. The little guy. She had a healthy delivery. Um, it is now two years later. She has a healthy son. She has no markers or blood antibodies for lupus or Sjogren's. Uh, interesting note, she went, her doctor who'd been following her, she'd had the diseases for four years, had all the symptoms, the rashes, the arthritis, the no saliva, everything, the miscarriages. And all the antibodies went away. She has zero issues. She's running 5Ks, pushing two kids. You see those women who, threw, who pushed those strollers with two kids in them? She was doing that, running 5Ks. And she said to her doctor, I want to come off my medicine because I don't have lupus and Sjogren's anymore. And he said, no, no, no. Even though your labs are negative, you still have it. So you need to be on the medicines forever. And she was really frustrated. So I said, you know what? Your doctor's not getting it. Go to another rheumatologist. So she goes to a new rheumatologist. And the new rheumatologist says, you are right. You do not have lupus or Sjogren's and you should not be on medication. And she goes, thank you. And she goes, but lupus and Sjogren's are incurable, so therefore you never had them. And all of those tests over the past four years were lab errors or mistakes. <laughs> so she was crying when she texted me. She was like, what is happening? I said, you know what? A lot of times, people, it's, it's amazing the kind of stories people are willing to invent rather than be open to changing their mind. And uh, I know all of us have that experience in that in some way where someone just refuses to listen. So I said, at least she's willing to help you to get off your meds and she's off her meds now doing great. But the story continues. So her husband near 
is now really happy because he has a healthy baby, healthy wife. Everything's okay. He's been very stressed out during the whole pregnancy, right? Well, after his wife gets better, he gets a call from Israel where his family is, and he finds out that his mother is in the hospital. And they tell Nir to come to the hospital because she'd had a devastating heart attack. And she, the words of the doctor was, uh, her heart's too sick to heal, so you have to come to Israel to say goodbye. Now, he had just watched his wife have a miraculous recovery, and he said, you know what? I'm not going to watch her say goodbye. I'm going to take this Vitamix blender, and I'm going to, because I teach people how to get their nutrition in through smoothies, and I'll show you how to do it. He said, I'm going to take this blender, and I'm taking it with me to the ICU. I don't care what they say. So he did that. So he goes in there, and I asked him, you know, what? tell me about your mom. So he tells me the background for his mom. She was 68. She'd had type 2 diabetes since she was 38, and even on insulin, Blood sugar is 200 to 300. Very high cholesterol, even on cholesterol meds. First heart attack was at 41. So she started really early with that. She'd had 25 heart attacks. Yeah, 25 heart attacks, three bypass surgeries, and 10 stents. So her heart had been sick for a really long time. She had been diagnosed with heart failure two years before, so her heart was already failing. She was on the way out. And her last heart attack, which is in 217, that's when they said, you have to come say goodbye. She's not coming back from this. So he goes with his Vitamix and makes her smoothies every day. She was discharged home five days later. She walked out of the hospital. Now, a year later, she's off her cholesterol meds. Uh, they've minimized her insulin. She has normal blood sugars, no more chest pain at all. She's lost over 20 pounds, and this is how she looks. This was her, she just flew into Florida for the holidays, and uh, you can see, I mean, she's not the same person anymore. So she's doing great now. She no longer has any kind of heart issues at all. Now, Nir should be relieved, right? His mom's okay, his wife's okay, but the stress gets to him. He gives me a call and he says, Dr. G, um, I, I've, got, I've got diabetes now. I said, how do you have diabetes? Your wife should be making you the food. And I healed her, so I know she knows what to eat. And he goes, well, when I'm working at school, he's a teacher. At lunchtime, we go out to eat, and maybe I don't always eat plant-based, or maybe I eat some junk food. And, uh, and you know, we talked for a while, and he ended up crying, and I, I talked to him. He was carrying so much stress. You know, sometimes something stressful is over, but you're still carrying it. And I told him, it's okay, and you're, you can let it go. She, your wife's okay, and your mom's okay. And if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to be the one that's in trouble. And so I got him to start exercising and to start eating healthy, and he got better really quickly. Um, I, I give all of my clients my cell phone number. I, doctors think I'm nuts, but I give all my clients my cell phone number. So he was letting me know three weeks later he was feeling really good. His blood sugar was already down to the 130s. He had already lowered his medication. Uh, he'd already lost 78 pounds. And the fatty liver he'd had for 15 years, gone in, in one month, Normal liver enzymes. That happens all the time. I see people with uh, high liver enzymes from meds or, you know, not uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Usually within three weeks, it's gone. And six weeks later, he's not diabetic. His HbA would see is 4.8. So that's him six weeks later. And here's the thing: the reason why I tell this story. So this is their these are beautiful kids. Now these two children here, they have the genes for lupus and Sjogren's, and fatty liver, and diabetes, and heart attacks, and heart failure. But these kids are not going to get sick because their parents are going to feed them in a different way that does not trigger their genes for illness. Because we all have genes for illness. Well, that's, just, that's just too bad. I mean, whatever our parents or grandparents have, we have those genes. But we don't need to trigger them, right? Because you're not born with diabetes. You're not born with fatty liver. You're not born with lupus. You trigger it by creating inflammation from the foods you eat. But if you feed a kid a really nourishing plant-based diet from the beginning, they'll never get those diseases. So when we do this, the diseases get to stop here and we create a new history for our families. And you know, I've been learning over the years that when I was in medical school, we learned that every generation outlives the generation before, but now it's not the case the kids that are young right now are not expected to outlive their parents for the first time in history because they are sicker than ever. But we have the power to change that. So if you leave with one thing today, do this not just for yourself, but we gotta do this for them because they deserve better and we need to take responsibility. And we have a bunch of little kids running around that are addicted to salty, fatty foods or eating nuggets and macaroni and cheese instead of eating fruits and vegetables. And it's because we've created addicts 
and we have to let them detox and they're going to be mad and they're going to be in a bad mood. But if you let them detox, they'll eventually come to their senses again. They're going to eat well and you're going to save their lives. You're going to save them from suffering. So I hope you do it for them. So because of all this work that I've been doing, um, I've gotten a little bit of attention. I didn't expect it. I actually just thought I was going to treat the homeless and, you know, die young. And that was kind of my life plan. But, um, you know, back in 2015, I wrote my book by lupus, and that was my first book. And I wrote it because whenever I would give a talk or I would talk to my patients, they'd say, man, I wish you had a book so I could tell someone or hand it to them. So I wrote it. Now, nobody knew who the heck I was in 2015, but when I had it on pre-order on Amazon, it went bestseller, and I'd never told anyone I wrote it. Like, I just logged in because I was going to delay the publication date a little longer because I wasn't done yet. And uh, Amazon doesn't let you d change your publication date if someone's ordered it. And I looked and I saw a bestseller and I'm like, what? Who, who found out about this book? So I realized that people really were searching Amazon for this information and they really needed it. So, um, so that's kind of where people really started to learn about my story. And I've had two best-selling books. Uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're going to be here. One of them's here and one of them's coming Thursday. But um, they are still bestseller to this day. Best, it, Goodbye Lupus has continued to be a bestseller since that day. Um, and there's all these reviews of people who've just read the book and got rid of their diseases, which makes my heart so happy. Um, and because of that attention. I've got, look at this, my son sold a cover here. He's just too cute. Um, but I've been on the cover of Vegan Health and Fitness three times. Um, Fit Over 40 was the most recent, which is really, a mag that's a cover that says you look good for your age. You know. <laughs> next, I'm applying for AARP. That's going to be my next cover. So I just need a few more years to go. Um, and I've been in Eating You Alive. How many of you guys saw Eating You Alive? If you haven't seen it, it's a great documentary, not just because I'm in it. It's actually, my mother even said, it's really good and not just because you're in it. So for a Jewish mother to say that, that's really meaningful. Um, but it's a really good movie that shows stories of people healing from all different diseases because the stories are what inspire us. And that's why it takes so much time to teach those. Um, but, you know, what this means to me and, you know, being mainstream is cool. I like doing stuff mainstream. As cool as it is to be on vegan publications, being on mainstream is more exciting to me because I'm going to reach more people. Like next month, I'm going to be in Woman's World magazine. You know that magazine that's like in the every supermarket in the checkout? They called me and they're going to do, there's an article that's going to be done on me um, in the next issue, I believe. So that's really cool because those are folks I wouldn't normally reach. So what this means to me, I don't really care about the attention because, you know, I'd never, it was never something I planned for. But what I love is that the word is getting out there and the more people who see me or hear me, the more lives that are going to be saved. So I'm really excited about it for that reason. And uh, that's why anytime anyone ever invites me to come talk, I'm like, yes, let's do it. Because you never know that one person who needed to hear that message that's going to save their life. So that's really been exciting to me. So how, how many of you guys actually want to hear about the protocol and how it works? So I, so I, I worked. All right, I got gotcha. you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so it's, it's, I, I like to make it really simple, so I do it in steps. I do six steps because I want it to be so simple that even doctors can understand it. So here's, <laughs> so, so the first three steps are all about not getting sicker, right? Because, you know, like when my husband gives talks about rapid fat loss, he always says, okay, I'm going to teach you the secrets to rapid fat loss. And step number one is stop getting fatter. <laughs> And everyone's like, what? And then, okay, it kind of makes sense, right? So step number one to healing is to stop getting sicker, right? So it means stop eating unhealthy foods. And what are unhealthy foods? I'm going to kind of run through these because I'm guessing it's a vegetarian society. You've probably heard that meat's not good for you. Uh, you've probably heard that dairy's not good for you, right? Absolutely the case. Um, so dairy is even worse than meat, but they're both really, really bad for you. They really are inflammatory. And again, I'll go into detail in the free classes, but I want you to get the basics down, okay? Processed foods. Um, they cause an immediate immune response. Your body doesn't know what those things are. So processed foods are like things that your grandmother wouldn't have ever eaten, you know, something that has chemicals in it, something that doesn't go bad, doesn't mold, right? All of those things. So processed foods and oils. Um, when you add oils to foods, you, you dramatically feed into your inflammation. I'm going to show you why this is, okay? Now, You've probably heard a lot of plant-based doctors talk about heart disease and other things, but what gets me really excited is the immune system. That is my favorite thing. So I talk about how things create inflammation. So I'm going to show you some a scientific pathway right now, but I don't want anybody to get nervous or fall asleep because they're like, oh, yeah. right. So um, I just want to show it to you so that you can understand how it works, but I don't want you guys to write down the pathway, okay? There's always someone who doesn't listen to me. I'm just, I want you to just kind of take it in, okay? 
So this is the inflammatory pathway, all right? So arachidonic acid is an omega-6 fatty acid that is the precursor or the ingredient that creates our inflammatory immune system, right? Now you need an inflammatory immune system. Your inflammatory immune system is what gets activated, like if you get an infection. So if you get a bacterial infection or a viral infection, you get a fever, right? That's your inflammatory immune system turning on so it could kill the thing. So you do want an inflammatory immune system. The problem is when your inflammatory immune system is turned on all the time, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, all the time, then it actually takes over and starts creating damage, okay? So here's what happens is that the more arachidonic acid you eat, so it comes from oils and processed foods and all animal products, right? The more of it you eat, the more enzymes you create, all right? Now, these enzymes break it down into the ingredients, all right? Everybody still with me? So the enzymes break arachidonic acid down into the, the uh, parts of our, our inflammatory immune system here, okay? So leukotriene B4, thromboxin E2, prostaglandin E2. Again, you don't need to know that. But the more arachidonic acid you have, the more of these enzymes you create because you have to break it down, so you need more enzymes to break it down, and the more of these anti-inflammatory immune system that you have. Does that make sense so far? Okay, cool. Now the problem is that all of these things have jobs that they do that then go haywire if there's too many. So for example, five locks is involved in cellular growth. Now we need cells to grow when you damage them, right? You bang your knee, you need to fix the cells, grow new cells. But if you have too much five locks, you're gonna get more cancer growth because you're growing too many cells. And if you have too much 5 locks, you're gonna have too much leukotriene. And this one here creates tons of inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, uh, atherosclerosis, heart attacks, chronic inflammation, destruction of healthy tissue, arthritis, edema, pain. There's more, but it ran out of room on the slide. So if you have any of this stuff or this stuff, you're eating too much of this stuff. Make sense? Cool. Now, COX-1 is involved with blood clots. It's important to have blood clots, right? If you cut yourself, if you don't make blood clots, you will bleed out. But if you have too much COX-1, what, what do you think happens? Heart attacks, strokes. Now, if you have COX-2 here, COX-2 is involved in vascular genesis, creating blood vessels. Again, if you get injured, you want to fix the blood vessel. But if you have too much COX-2, you're going to get more cancer growth because you're going to create more blood supply to cancer. And if you have too much prostaglandin E2, you're going to have more cancer, more irritable bowel disease, more chronic inflammation and pain. So again, if you have any of these things, you're going to, it's because you're eating too much of these things. And by the way, I learned this pathway in medical school. What I didn't learn was where it came from. Well, they never taught us where arachidonic acid came from. They just taught us this pathway. And then right here, they taught me which medications to use to block the enzymes. So that's what I learned. Like, okay, Vioxx will stop COX-2 and aspirin stops COX-1, right? So that's what I learned. And none of us in my class of over 100 people ever thought to ask, well, where does it come from and can we just shut it off that way? So... If you, that, that's, and that's why your doctor doesn't talk to you about it. It's just because they don't know. They never thought to ask. They put so much information in your head in medical school, you don't know that anything's missing, right? How would you know that? Now, the other thing you want to do if you're trying to get better is to add healing foods. This, by the way, is what's missing from most plant-based diets when people get sick or are already plant-based. So let me ask you this. How many of you are already plant-based but still have some health issues that you haven't been able to get rid of? It's okay, guys. It's okay to be honest about it. I, I treat a lot of people now that are plant-based or vegan and have health issues because when they don't get better, they come to me because my understanding is on the cellular biology of how foods work in the body. And so I have vegan doctors and vegan celebrities who come to me when they get sick on the DL because they need to get better. And they're afraid that people will think, oh, plant-based isn't the key to getting better. That's not the case. Um, I'll give you an example. Ellen Joffe Jones, how many of you guys know her? She lets me talk about it. So she's a, <laughs> nope. <laughs> so she is a famous vegan athlete. Uh, she has written tons of books. She wrote a book called um, Vegan for $4 a Day. It was a New York Times bestseller. And uh, she used to be a chef for the McDougal program, teaching people how to make to cook plant-based food. So she's been plant-based for like decades. And just this past year, she got psoriasis. So uh, she went to Dr. Khan, who out in Detroit, and he texted me, um, this is Ellen, fix her, which that's how New Yorkers and Northeast people talk. It's just like very to the point. And I said, okay, cool, I'll do that. So with her, she was not eating any animal products, 
And that's probably why it took her so long to get psoriasis, because she's in her 60s, and she probably would have gotten it much younger. But she wasn't eating enough of the healing foods that allowed her body to repair itself, and so she eventually still got sick. What I can tell you, though, is two weeks later, after adding what I told her to, uh, the psoriasis went away completely. All the plaques are gone. I just saw her at a conference. Um, I saw her for the first time in person, because I see everybody online now. That's all I do, is I work online and see people from all over the world from my computer. And uh, it was the first time I got to hug her. And she put my face into all of her slides and her talks. Um, this is a lady who, who saved my life. But, you know, so a lot of times when people are plant-based, they're missing this. And definitely when people are not plant-based, they're missing this. So, uh, so the healing foods are super important, and that's why I want to focus our time. So the first thing you need to do, which most people don't do, plant-based or not, is eat raw vegetables. Now, the number one most commonly eaten vegetable in the U.S. is ketchup. Yep, and uh, that's followed by french fries. And raw vegetables, unheard of. So maybe a piece of lettuce on the burger, maybe it's the kale that decorates the salad bar, right? So um, what I found is that raw vegetables specifically have a powerful potential to reverse illness quickly. They are, when it comes from the earth the way it was created for us, or the way it was grown from the earth, it's intact. The vitamins, all the phytonutrients, you know, when you're, the, the first medications came from the rainforest, right? It turns out what we need to heal actually grows on the planet itself, it was not created in the lab. So when it comes out, nature, it works really well. And I have people focus on, you know, when I look at nutrient density, that means like how much good power is in the food. The most powerful foods you can eat are green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale and chard and cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower. And when people do programs with me, I have them eat, I start them out at about eight cups a day raw vegetables. And by the time they get rolling, it's like 10 to 12 cups a day. That's what I ate to get better, by the way, uh, about 10 to 12 cups of raw vegetables a day. How many of you guys eat that much raw vegetables? a day? Right, okay. So, exactly. So, uh, if you find that you are either not having good energy, you're overweight and can't seem to lose it, or uh, you're having a lot of inflammation in your body and you're missing your raw vegetables, you should be looking at that. And I really recommend when people are sick, you know, if you're healthy, you know, try to add at least half your plate to come from that. If you're sick, 80% or more, right? So, most people, their salad's like this big, and then they're like meat or pasta as the rest of the plate. I want you to reverse that, have a big salad and maybe just put a little bit of like beans or cooked vegetables or something with it. You'll find that you feel better than you could ever imagine. It's really powerful how good you feel. The next thing is water. Most people are walking around severely dehydrated Severely dehydrated. Um, and when you're dehydrated, number one is you can't actually reverse the disease because all of the chemical pathways that are necessary for healing require water as an ingredient. So even if you eat, imagine eating 10 cups of vegetables a day and still not getting better because you didn't drink enough water. That's a bummer, right? So you really want to get your water for that reason. Number two, uh, being dehydrated is the number one cause of the most expensive, uh, or I guess the most lucrative uh, drug sales we have. So number one is the most common cause of headaches. Uh, when you're low in water, uh, your body will pull water out of the cells up here, and it causes your brain to tug on the sides of your head. So uh, oftentimes, you have a headache or migraine. Just drinking a couple liters of water can clear it up. And it's also the number one cause of constipation. So you think about how much money is made in medications for constipation and, and headaches, right? Constipation is a big one, and it causes a lot of distress because there's a lot of people walking around really grumpy and mad because they can't poop. And it's affecting marriages, and it's affecting lives. Um, you know, <laughs> water is supposed to be absorbed in your large intestine, and uh, so your poop's supposed to come out like a lazy river on a nice little watery trail, right? So it's supposed to, the water's supposed to guide it out. And if you're not drinking enough water, it gets stuck. Like, do you ever, um, you ever see one of those, like, you know those tubular slides they have at water parks, right? It's like if you were trying to go down one of those slides without any water in it, right? You'd just be like, oh, oh, yeah. Ugh, right? That's what's happening if you're not drinking enough water. So if you find that you are pushing and you can't get your poop out, uh, you're probably dehydrated. And the most common symptom of dehydration is lack of thirst. So when someone says, I don't drink because I'm just not thirsty, then I know for sure they're dehydrated. Because when people get on my program and I get them drinking 96 to 128 ounces a day, they're thirsty all the time. I have to tell them to slow down. So for healing, I usually recommend people have at least 96 ounces of water a day. You might have already figured out between all the fiber from the raw vegetables and the water, you're in the bathroom a lot. You're peeing and pooping as your next job. Can't fix that, guys. 
Um, if you want to heal with food, it has to go in and it has to come out. So I can't, I haven't figured out a solution for that yet. Um, <laughs> I know I was in the bathroom a lot when I was healing, but you know, it was worth it. I had the energy. It was all right. So, and the other thing that's missing from most diets, most diets and even plant-based diets is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I recommend people get them from flax and chia seeds, but, um, how many of you guys have heard that, you know, you should avoid all fats, eat super low fat diets? <laughs> A lot of the plant-based stocks will say that too. So uh, unfortunately, omega-3s are kind of the baby that got thrown out of the, with the bathwater when it comes to fats. So oils are bad for you. Saturated fats from animal products are bad for you. Omega-3s are essential, and I'm going to show you why really quick. So number one, uh, they become a part of your cell membranes. So every cell in your body is filled with water. And then you have a phospholipid membrane around it that's made of um, fats. And that's to keep your cells waterproof, right? So you don't dissolve. You would be a puddle on the floor if you didn't have that. Now, omega-6 fats make your cells really rigid. So again, omega-6 comes from animal products and oils, right? Omega-3s make your cells really flexible so that when there's a signal that comes to your cell, it can receive it. It won't bounce off of it like it will if it's full of omega-6. And uh, you can release toxins. So I'll show you here. So here's a healthy membrane with a lot of omega-3s. Nutrients go in and toxins come out. That's normal. But if you're omega-3 deprived, which most people are because you can't make omega-3s, you have to eat them, then you get a, a really tough membrane that nutrients can't get into. So you're eating 10 cups of vegetables a day and you can't even get any nutrients out of it. That's not going to work really well. And you're full of toxins. So it's also why people go through a detox period. Usually when they switch to my plan, they eat tons of omega-3s, they eat tons of nutrients, and all of a sudden they feel worse. It's not because the veggies are bad for them. It's because they're suddenly releasing all the toxins they've been carrying around. So it's kind of like the childbirth of getting healthy. The, you get worse, and then it gets better afterwards. Um, and another thing about omega-3s, they're really good for brain health. I'm not going to go into that too far here, but it does protect against dementia as well. And what really gets me excited is what it does for the immune system. So this is the source of your anti-inflammatory immune system. So if you think about what I told you, if you're eating tons of foods that give you inflammatory immune cells, right? So you're eating all the animal products and processed foods and oils, and you're making all this inflammation, and then you need omega-3s to get rid of it, but most people aren't eating any of them at all, which makes sense why everybody's sick, right? Because we're creating inflammation every day, but we can't get rid of it. So I'm going to show you another one of those little... Um, chemical pathways to show you how it works again. You guys aren't scared this time because it was okay last time. So flax and chia seeds, they create something called ALA. And when we go down the pathway, it creates EPA and DHEA. Have you guys heard of that? That's the omega-3s people have usually heard of, right? And that creates our anti-inflammatory immune cells. So that's the leukotriene B5 and prostaglandin E3. So I'm gonna show you something really cool before we finish up here about how I actually hack people's health and why people get better so fast with me because we get results faster than anyone. Three to six weeks, I can usually create a dramatic change if not complete change of people's health. This is part of why, because I hack into the omega-3 pathway, okay? So you guys ready for this? It's so cool. Okay. I, I get excited. I don't know if you guys are excited, but I'm excited. So these are those two pathways side by side, but nobody's nervous anymore, right? So that's the omega-6 pathway. Remember this? This is the vegetable oils, and it's, uh, that creates the arachidonic acid that creates the inflammatory pathway, right? Everybody guys remember that? Yeah. And then this is the omega-3 pathway. Flax and chia seeds come down, ALA, and create the anti-inflammatory pathway. Have you guys ever been told or heard that you can't convert um, flax or chia seeds into omega-3s efficiently? You guys ever heard that? Yeah, so this is why that tends to be the case. Because ALA and LA up here, they use the same enzyme to create their products. And this enzyme prefers the omega-6 pathway. I don't know why, maybe it had a fight with ALA at some point in the past, but it really likes LA better. And if you eat animal fats and processed foods, even if you have a little bit of flax or chia, you're going to preferentially create uh, the inflammatory immune cells. But, when people are on my plan, we get rid of the oils and animal products and processed foods, right? And that leaves this entire enzyme and it will go over here. So bam, look at that. Oh my God, there's so much EPA, DHA, and now we're getting a huge amount of the anti-inflammatory cells made. Isn't that cool? 
So cool. And even more exciting is when you create EPA, it actually inhibits the breakdown of arachidonic acid into the inflammatory immune cells. So when you give up the animal products and the processed foods and you start flooding your body with omega-3s, you actually preferentially create an anti-inflammatory effect in your body, which is why people get better so fast because they're not creating any inflammation and they're actively getting rid of it on a daily basis. So if you guys aren't eating omega-3s, it's time to start chowing down on these. Uh, I usually get people to eat about half a cup a day to start. And then when their gut adjusts, I start increasing it from there. So it's really, really, really important. If you find that you get constipated with too much seeds, you can also use a cold pressed flax oil. Um, you got to keep that stuff refrigerated though, because it breaks down quickly. So uh, so those are the basics of the steps, and I go into the science more deeply either in my book of Bilupus or when you come to my free classes so you can understand more about it. But I wanted to give you that because I think it's something that, you know, a lot of people don't, well, I know nobody else teaches this pathway, and I think it's important to understand. You know, I was one of those people that I always have to know why. I don't like just being told what to do. Maybe it's the New Yorker in me, I don't know. But I like to know, I love science and I love teaching science. So I thought you found that, hope you found that exciting. Now, before I go, I wanted to teach you a way that you can easily get all of this stuff in uh, about five minutes a day. Would that be good? Cool, all right, so. Um, I don't know, a lot of people tell me that they don't like to just sit and eat kale all day like I do. Um, is that, that, so yeah, um, I, I love kale um, and close-ups apparently. But um, when I talk about eating this much greens a day and omega-3s and all this water, it's intimidating for a lot of people. A lot of people come to me and they've been eating McDonald's and they've been eating all these horrible foods and the idea of eating all these salads all day really freaks them out. So my husband and I created something that we call the smoothie solution. We figured out that if you put all the ingredients into a blender, preferably a, a high-speed blender like a Vitamix, you can get like eight cups of greens in there right, 75% greens, get that half a cup of flax or chia, and then put fruit in there, a couple cups of fruit, like pineapple and mangoes and bananas and things, and water, you can usually get about 40 ounces of water in there and blend it and put a straw in it, and you can literally sip that all day and you're gonna get in all the nutrients you need for the entire day through a straw. Isn't that cool? And most people are willing to do that. They don't want to sit and eat salad, but they will sit and sip. And there are some docs that have never used these who are like, oh, I don't think smoothies are good, but they've never tested it. I've been using smoothies for a decade now. They work really well and people are healthy now because of them. So, they, so um, I want you guys to have free recipes. Do you guys like free recipes? Cool. Um, take a screenshot of this because this is where you can get them. SmoothieShred.com is a website my husband created because he wanted to start giving away as much information as possible for free to the public. Uh, recipes, videos, um, we do Q&As, everything we can to help people um, because we think that this information should be free to everybody. Everybody should be able to get their health back and it, that it shouldn't be information that holds you back. I always say that you need to take back your life and he always says you got to save your wife. So. <laughs> So make sure you get a screenshot of that. Um, and then uh, if you go to Smoothie Shred, you'll see you can get recipes, all these, look at all these smoothie recipes, all these videos we make every day. Um, and then we also uh, give you an invitation if you want to join our free Facebook community where we announce all our free classes and we do Q and A's and we just, uh, you know, you don't even have to be vegan to join this, the Facebook group. You just have to agree to start eating your vegetables. So uh, we are very welcome and we help people. Uh, it's the entry drug. It's like the gateway drug to becoming vegan is you start, you start doing the smoothies all day and you feel so good that you can't wait to have more vegetables. It really works. And there's people in there that are just losing weight and they're reversing their diseases all by just being a part of the free group. The other thing I said I would tell you how to do is to learn this stuff in detail. So if you've enjoyed me for an hour, imagine spending five with me. So I teach these free classes online. Uh, they're three separate classes so I don't wear you out. And every class I go into detail about how it works and why. And the third class is actually two hours of case studies showing you person after person exactly what they did and how they got better so that people can get inspired and excited to see how this works. So uh, my next classes are coming up on the 22nd and they're online and they're 100% free. Um, I'm just teaching my heart out and I get, I get messages from people all the time saying that they reverse their diseases just coming to the classes. So uh, if you go to goodbyelupus.com, you'll see this banner. You can't miss it, it's this big and you click the, the click here thing, see that? And, uh, and you'll be able to register for those. And then I'll see you there. You can go, hey, I saw you in Honolulu. You know, and we'll, we'll say hi to each other. So um, smoothieshred.com is again where you can join our family. And I just wanna leave you with how to reach me. So if any of you guys wanna reach me after this, um, if you're any of you on social media, 
So Instagram, I'm at Goodbye Lupus. I had to join Instagram for the youngins. I'm in my 40s, but I finally did it. Um, Facebook, I'm Goodbye Lupus. What do you think I am on Twitter? No, I'm at Vegan Medical Doc. Okay. Um, YouTube, I put videos out every day to inspire people and encourage people. I do videos of me coaching people if they give me permission, which they all do, so that anything I can do to just help people, I'm constantly putting uh, stuff out there for them. Um, these are my websites, goodbylupus.com and Smoothie Shred. Um, and that's my email. That's my personal email. And that's my personal number at the office. It's an electronic uh, phone system. So you can send text messages and you'll actually hear from me faster if you do. It takes me a long time to go through voicemails, but I, I text pretty quickly. So just take a screenshot of this page so that you have a way to reach me if you need to. I love hearing from people and I love helping people. So um, I hope I inspired you. I hope I taught you something. And uh, I'll be sticking around here to answer your questions too. So thank you guys so much. All right, so the question is about um, the difference between vegetables that are labeled organic and I guess ones that are just the regular kind. All right, so organic vegetables, there's a certain things that they have to uh, abide by in order to be considered organic. So one is they have to have soil that's a better quality soil. Uh, so you get more nutrients because the soil is better quality. Um, and number two is that they haven't used any kind of chemicals or pesticides on it. So whenever I get broccoli and I find a little worm in it, I'm like, that's organic, baby, you know, because <laughs> if a worm couldn't live on it, I don't want to eat it. Um, but uh, what I have found, though, is that you don't have to buy organic in order for it to work. When I recovered my health, I was an intern. I couldn't even, I, I was, I had a 35000 a year I was getting for being an intern, and my rent was 1100 a month for my studio in L.A., so I couldn't afford that, and I just bought whatever produce I could, and I still reversed my disease. So the benefits you get from the vegetables outweigh potential danger from pesticides and things, but it's still better if you can to buy organic or to buy certain ones organic. Like if you look online, the daily, uh, the um, there's there's ones that oh, now I just lost. I'm getting Gregor's Daily Dozen in my head, but there's the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. There it is. So if you if you Google online, you can find which uh, vegetables and fruits are more likely to contain high pesticides and which aren't. So I always buy my greens organic, but like bananas, you know, if there's not organic ones around, they don't usually have high pesticide content. So, so you're asking if uh, what makes my diet unique is it just the omega threes? So it is the focus on one raw produce. Um, usually when people go plant-based, they eat lots of cooked vegetables, but they're not getting the raw vegetables in. Number two is um, the omega-3 content. And three is the focus on water. Nobody ever talks about how essential water is for disease recovery. So those are the, that's why I focused on those things today. Yeah. And so if you're already healthy, just add what you're missing. If you just add that blender a day, you're going to find that you have tons of energy, magnificent bowel movements. You're not going to have... Um, you're not going to have a lot of aches and pains at all. You're going to find that you get younger because it makes your skin glow. Uh, so it just gives you a lot of benefits if you're healthy. And if you're unhealthy, you're going to start feeling a lot better. Sure. So the question is about there's a lot of popularity with the Mediterranean diet. And so people go, oh, people who eat Mediterranean diet tend to be healthier than Americans. Maybe it's because they eat all that olive oil. Let's just drink olive oil. No, really, there's people who do that. Uh, so what they found is, and there's been a lot of recent studies looking at it, is that people who live in the Mediterranean uh, tend to eat tons of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, they tend to eat much less meat. They might just be a little piece of their plate instead of the majority of their plate. Um, and so the olive oil doesn't really affect them as negatively. Also, olive oil itself is not inflammatory. So it's not part of the inflammatory pathway I showed. It's the only oil that's not. All the other ones, the sesame oil, the uh, safflower oil, all those other ones are inflammatory. Olive oil is an omega-9. It's not essentially inflammatory. However, it does damage your uh, blood vessels, your endo endothelial layer of your blood vessels. So it's bad for people who have heart disease. But that's why people have gotten away with that. But it's not the olive oil that's causing their health. It's, it's in spite of the oils that, they're, that they tend to be healthier. In the back. All right, so the question is that a lot of times if someone has diabetes, their doctor will say to take, uh, have no more than 5 per 10% fat from your diet. Now, um, if you have type 2 diabetes or even type 1 diabetes, uh, you really need to make sure you stay away from animal products because what they found is the cause of type 2 diabetes, the insulin resistance, comes from the saturated fat coating your muscle cells and blocking your insulin receptors. So what they find is when you get rid of animal fat, uh, the insulin receptors are exposed and blood sugar comes down really quickly because now insulin can bind and your blood sugar goes down. Um, so that is definitely true. 
However, omega-3s do not do that. Omega-3s actually accelerate the recover from diabetes. So like you saw with Nir, he was doing half a cup of more a day of omega-3s and he was no longer diabetic at all within six weeks. So that, the omega-3 fatty acids do not behave like other fats. You know, I've heard some people miss say, oh, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. It's not true. There are different types of fat. And some fats become cells, like omega-3s. They become cells, part of your cell membranes. They become your anti-inflammatory immune cells. They do not become body fat. They do not block insulin receptors. Thank you again. Mahalo to all of you for coming. And have a safe return home. Good night, everyone.